Angela Bell McSweeney comes from a third generation racing family, an iconic figure on and off the track. She now holds a spot as a director on the Australian Turf Club board. Welcome to Women in Racing, Angela Bell McSweeney. You're currently on the board of directors here at the ATC, but you have a rich history in racing, your third generation racing family. Can you remember your first memory of racing? Oh, gee, Lizzie. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for having me and congratulate you on the series. Even the gentleman that bought the Everest Trophy today said it's fantastic. So good on you for the incentive. Thank you. My first memory, I've been going to the race course since I was about six years of age. And um, I guess the first memory was the glamour. All my mother's friends arriving, looking wonderful and having a champagne before they headed off to Royal Randwick. And then me being lucky enough to go quite often when I think I should have been doing other things at the playground, I was on the racetrack. We had a lot of horses so if it was a big day um, I'd always be there. For people who don't know, you've come from a family of horse trainers and that's sort of flowed through your blood all the way through to this day. It has. My um, grandfather, Patrick Nalen, actually was lovely getting ready for the series. I found a wonderful article that I'd love to give my grandchildren uh, all about my grandfather and he evidently had, the, it said in the article, the best equipped and most elaborate stables in Australia and they were quite beautiful. He had an acre of land and being Irish, loved horses and dogs so he made sure the environment for the horses was magnificent. He had all sorts of animals and trees and it, it, it was wonderful. And when I was a very little girl we still lived in that house and I'd see the horses coming up the driveway. Our house was in front of the stable and I'd see them getting onto the float. So really I think Racing is just intrinsic, it's part of my who I am. I also had a quick read through the article and it said that he was a horse lover, which I think is really important because some people may not realise how much trainers love their animals, but even back then he was very oh, passionate. He was so passionate. He was almost known as a horse whisperer at the time. But I think we've just seen the Winx effect and the love that that horse has generated and the hope for people who have been ill and uh, just the awareness. I mean, that magnificent animal. Uh, when she stood at the end of the race with Hugh Bowman, she knew she was the queen of the turf. And they are such highly intelligent, magnificent animals. And it's exciting, the next 10 years in racing in Australia, I mean, it's global. Hugh Bowman and Winx have put us on the global map with the Everest. It's been um, well documented recently, or well documented the past um, decade, I suppose, is that the fashions on the field is very prominent and draws people to the races. And we can be very thankful because that's something that you actually initiated. I did, I did. I actually went to Melbourne and there was a plane strike at the time, so I caught the train back. And I was very frustrated because in Melbourne they seemed to be going so far ahead of us and of course they had all the fashions and the fashions on the field and we weren't doing a thing in Sydney. So as luck would have it, there were some friends on the train, at, his name was Huey Gage and he said if I ever get on the committee we'll invite you in to tell us what you've told us passionately tonight. So um, he became a director and invited me in and I started the fashions on the field. The other directors at the time too, Lizzie, the, the dressing had stopped, which was a very st a sad element to lose because our racing in Australia is a cultural import from England. And if you think of My Fair Lady and the Ascot Gavotte and the black and white dresses and the scene from the Derby, that's why we dress to such an extent. And I don't think we can ever lose that because it's part of the experience. So I very quickly started, um, phoned all my sponsors and friends and managed to get wonderful prizes. And I was also the first one to bring children into the competitions and men because I've always had a feeling that we wanted, I wanted to get the racing just out of the sporting pages and onto other areas so that there was a greater awareness. And I, th I think that's one of the main things I've always wanted to do with racing. I virtually used fashions on the field as a tool to bring people and entice them to the track. And now with the young people coming, they love to dress up, you know, and the men just as much as the women. You know, they plan their outfit and it's all part of that experience that our new generation want. They want trendy bars, they want um, craft beers, they want wonderful cocktails, they want the experience. 
and part of the experience is the fashion and dressing up. And bringing youth to the races as well is something that the Australian Turf Club and all of your directors have been trying to encourage. How do you think you can do that through the future? Well, it's we've already had a lot of success. 55% um, of our new members are all under the age of 35. So we have a special panel of young people to advise us of, in case we're missing some element. But um, I, I think yeah, it's, it's happening, it's already happening, but it takes a lot of work. You spent a bit of time um, in the UK and Royal Ascot was something that you were part of with the BBC. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was very honoured actually. I went to Royal Ascot when I was very young and I remember my father looking at the press balcony and saying, that's the press balcony, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could do some coverage one day? And I thought, well, I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, as my life turned out, I was invited. I met Julian Wilson and he was the host and uh, he invited me onto the show and then he rang to say we'd like the BBC would like you to come back and uh, do all the fashion coverage. So I did that for a couple of years, which was a fantastic experience. The experience of being able to step out onto the world stage and experience other race meetings has been obviously very beneficial for you to bring back to Australia. It has, and I always like to think, as I'm third generation racing, that I do act wherever I go as an ambassador for Australian racing. And I think our own Australian racing really is the best in the world. It's, it's fantastic. And what Peter Volandis has now done with the Everest, again, put us on the world stage in the Golden Eagle. So we're, we're innovators. And uh, while a lot of the other crowds are diminishing and memberships are getting smaller, the Australian Turf Club's membership is growing, so much so that for the time being we, we, we stopped it. How did you initially gain your role on the ATC board? Um, I was encouraged by a lot of the members who felt again that some of the style and panache was leaving the Australian Turf Club. So many members came up and said to me, Angela, run for the board. And I was actually with my daughter, my best friend on this earth, my daughter Juliet, we were driving and uh, I had a phone call from Jim Mathers and he said you just have to run. So I put the phone down and I said Juliet everyone wants me to run for the directorship of the board and she said you've just got to do it. So when she gave me the okay that was it and then I ran one other friend who I really trust her opinion, Catherine Hale and uh, I rang her and she said do it and I'll be your campaign manager. So it was quite, um, quite competitive Lizzie, I had to beat 11 very worthy men, but I was determined to win because I had run 25 years earlier. And at that stage, it was very chauvinistic. I mean, they put my name on the ballot paper they sent out with an asterisk next to all the other directors and put me at the bottom and it wasn't in alphabetical order. So there, there was a little bit of um, unfair play. So I thought if I'm going to run this time, I really need to win. Is it huge change from now and from prior to you trying? I mean, it must be, now you're on the board, it must feel really satisfying. Well, it does, and uh, the gender equality is such an important issue in the world. And I'm really proud, again, of my fellow directors and our wonderful chairman, Matt McGrath, with the inroads we're making. We've done the female jockey's room up, which is fantastic now, equal to the boys with spa facilities. And we have to remember now, even at the Everest, nearly half the crowd were female spectators. So women in racing are becoming more and more prominent. You mentioned about the female jockey's room being done up. I mean, they are the ladies we have at the races at the moment who are riding are incredible athletes. You know a few of them personally. How do you feel the future is holding for women in racing? Well, over 60% of the apprentices coming through are female. So that's a wonderful statistic. And out of the last four years, two of the um, prized awards for the apprenticeship went to females. So the, the, the girls are really doing it. They really are. And talking with um, Michelle Payne, she was saying, you know, when uh, Bart Cummings employed her, he loved her soft hands on the horse. So the girls, the girls do it their own special way. As a member of the board, what has the progression of racing been like in your eyes? Um, very exciting. Since I've been on the board with my hard-working fellow directors, the stabling's been finished and we actually won an international award for that. 
Our tracks have never been better, which I think is the core of racing. We've built the poly tracks, and of course, the crowds are now in excess of 40,000, which is absolutely fantastic. So it's been an exciting time, and the Everest, the launch of the Everest, it's been busy, but wonderful. Is the Everest and the Golden Eagle the races that are going to keep bringing people back to the track and keep the momentum there? Well, I'm hoping that they will, and I'm sure they will, because the effect, the Winx effect, just brought so much awareness to our sport and I think that that's the thing that needs to keep happening all the time, that that awareness goes out to the public, that they can be part of this great Australian ethos and this very exciting sport. There's no better day, Lizzie, as you would agree, than a day at the races. It has every element of fun, of camaraderie, of going with your friends, of dressing up and of having that experience that all the young people love to have. Tell us about being the first women to win Racing Personality of the Year. Oh, that was such a buzz. I went that night and I really didn't expect to win, but I was very proud because my father and mother were in the room and uh, it was just such a thrill to go up on the stage and at that stage racing was still quite chauvinistic and I followed in John Shrek and Ross Quibb and very famous men of the racing world, so I was more than honoured and it's a thrill that I'll never forget. And the trophy is fantastic. It's a champagne bucket. So. <laughs> Very fitting. <laughs> Very fitting. So uh, it's, it's brought out quite a lot and enjoyed still to this day. Your family have been involved in racing for a long time, but your daughter also enjoys going to the races, Juliet. Is it nice to see your family, your immediate family, now enjoying the races like you have in the past? It's wonderful, and Juliet's in this new filly that I've just bought, so that's exciting. We're going to be racing it together with another syndicate of women. And um, my grandson's, they're four and six. They haven't been to the race course yet, but they watch Winx. They've got Winx flags. And when I did the presentation, one of the presentations for Winx, they were all sitting up on the couch watching me. And um, Leo, when I actually became a director, he told all his friends that Mama's won the race. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't wait for them to join me on the race course. And I'm quite sure they'll be the fifth generation following along. You are one of those people who are, is rain, hail or shine, is always at the races, you know, <laughs> part of um, presentations and, and meeting with owners and making the experience really beneficial for everyone, which is really positive. Well, I love it, Lizzie. I just, I, I really do love it. I've, have a great passion and there are so many different elements to the race day. Our wonderful sponsors, we couldn't have our races without our sponsors, Longines and Moat Hennessy and all the sponsors and Tab that um, support us. So doing the presentations, meeting the sponsors, seeing the elation of the owners, it's a thrill for me. I feel very honoured every time I walk on the racetrack. What does the future hold for Australian racing here at the ATC? Well it's going to be more exciting than ever and we're very lucky Jamie Barkley is our CEO and he's innovative and has brilliant ideas and he's done so much in his very short term so far of six months. We've seen all sorts of wonderful things happen. So with our great chairman and my fellow directors and Jamie Barkley, watch this space. There's two other females on the board, Julia Ritchie and Trish Egan, and there's plenty of diversity amongst the group of directors, which should be really positive for the future. It is. It's a very balanced committee and again, um, I don't really think people realise how hard we work but it's fantastic to be part of that directorship with those wonderful people and it, it is balanced. We all have our different roles but we all have the one common link of loving racing and just wanting to see the Australian Turf Club become the most prestigious club in the world. On your website, Angela Bell, I, I saw this most beautiful quote, my greatest wish is to leave a lasting legacy to women, to truly believe in their own greatness and wisdom. I wish to pass on the skill and knowledge I have learnt from my varied experiences, both in business and personal life. These attributes have given me the strength to endure triumph through all of life's ups and downs. Um, thank you, Lizzie. I guess uh, I'd like to pay homage to my parents, Molly and Tony McSweeney. There's never a race day that I go to that people don't come up and tell me that they'd be proud that I was still on the race course and working for the community in racing and also 
My other grandmother, May, she, um, May McSweeney, she never missed the races. And all my, um, my forebears, I just hope they're proud of what I'm doing because I'm very honoured to be a McSweeney and I've really loved being here with you and the interview. Thank you. Thank you.